Hey everyone, what is up? Welcome to the first episode of the Literary Latte Podcast. I'm your host, Brandon. And I'm Katie. The other host. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank y'all for joining the first episode. You know, Katie and I, we've known each other for quite a while now. How many years has it been? Uh, I think five or six. Five or six years. We used yeah. to work together in the business field we're both accountants which is so much fun it's unfortunately (laughs) (laughs) uh, we work together and you know despite not working together we've managed to maintain a friendship which Mm -hmm. is always good so we got together because we've always talked and then i recently i have a youtube channel b lord af b l o r d a f shameless plug um in my video Thank you. Um, In my recent, I did like a New Year's resolutions video. And one of my things was wanting to read a new book a month. Mm -hmm. And Katie, that spoke to her. And she was like, I want to do that too. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny that that's your perspective because I was already reading a lot because I was tired of all of the shows on Netflix. And I saw that was your resolution. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to be a good friend and I'm going to help Brandon keep this resolution. Well, yes, it it what it spoke to her in a sense of let's get together and start a book club. But Katie there was already go. ahead of me in the reading department. Yes, because I was always a reader as a kid. And it sounds like you were, too. I was when I was a lot younger. Mm-hmm. I remember like probably I'm trying to remember, was it during like middle school or like at least in elementary mm-hmm. school? I would love going to like the Barnes and Noble and like mm-hmm. looking through the books. I like the yeah. scholastic book fairs. And I've then... never been to one of those. I was homeschooled. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, they were really fun. That's the SpongeBob heard. books were always really fun. I was not allowed to watch SpongeBob. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um but, you know. but i did the the barnes and noble uh trips like that was a weekly thing in my house like both of my parents love to read my dad especially and we would, would go on like a saturday and go sit in barnes mm-hmm. and nobles or borders or whatever the borders <laughs> i remember R. borders yeah, r.i.p borders gone. Yeah, no, it was definitely elementary school because I'm remembering going through the bookshelves yeah. of Borders. And like, you know what? Underrated bookstore. Was it as good as Barnes & Noble? Not in ambiance sense, but, you know, it was still good. It was good. Yeah. What kind of books did you read? Were you like a uh, um, Hardy Boys is the thing that comes to mind. I don't I think that's a homeschool thing, though. I wasn't like a book series person. Like I wasn't like a Hardy Boys or an Encyclopedia Brown. I think I would just read like random books. And I don't even remember exactly like what genre in particular. I think I like different ones. I did like, what was that in elementary school actually with the series? The Magic Treehouse where they would go to like, they would go in a treehouse and then it would take them. They would like time travel, which is funny. Remember the Magic School Bus? No, it was like oh. the um, it was like a tree. I think it was the magic tree house. It was something like that. Oh. But they would go to the tree house and then they would like time travel. And like one book, they went to the Revolutionary War. Oh, Another nice. book, they went to like, it okay. was like pretty historical. And that was pretty interesting, which funny enough, time mm-hmm. travel is a big um plot point in a lot of these books we're going to discuss <laughs> today. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, yeah, so those, I liked books that were, like, also movies. Like, I liked stuff like that. Fairy tales. Okay. Yeah. What I kind read, did you like? I read, um, I was really into the American Girl series for a hot minute. Okay. I got a couple of those. Uh, and I read them. I don't know if they're still like this, but they were a series of, like, I think six or seven books. But they were, like, a quarter of an inch thick. They were so, so tiny. Um, okay. And, like, each one would focus on, like, some event in the girl's life. So I read Samantha and Molly and Kit. Those are the ones that were, like, my favorite. Um, okay. And then I, I was into uh, children's versions of literary classics. So, like, 
<laughs> Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> Pride and Prejudice was a big one that I read like the the condense a bridge kids version of. Okay. And then eventually graduated to reading like the full book. Mm-hmm. Um and so I did a lot of those. Um I like dipped into the Christian romance. Ooh, scandalous. <laughs> the, they all follow the same plot point, but they're just like uh, like a like a kiss is this like scandalous thing that happens and and um oh, yeah. I read so many of those because there's so many of them. Um and eventually as I got older and did not have to get my parents permission on what books to read because I was homeschooled. You graduated um, to proper romance books. Yeah. So now I do a lot of um a lot of fantasy books. Like I've done the Court of Thorns and Roses, great series. Currently reading uh the Throne of Glass series, which is great. Um and then really just it's kind of same as you where like I'll just kind of pick up random books as well. So I'll any kind of small bookstore and if they have a display and it catches my eye, I you know, do a little bit of everything. Yeah, I mean that's how I that's how I have found all of the books that we have read so far has been because either someone posted on Instagram and was like, This looks cool, or it was a cover that caught my eye in a bookstore. And True. I, I didn't know anything about about the author and we just read like the synopsis and was like yeah this sounds great let's do that right katie will just message me and be like hey this look good and i'm like it actually does let's try it (laughs) but i I did see when i went to barnes and noble recently to try and find the book we're gonna read for april i um the they had a whole display for the invisible life of addie larue the paperback it came out yeah yeah like just it that the paperback came out like a month before we had decided to read it so had we waited we could have done <laughs> the paperback but i heard the paperback cover was like not as nice um the I... the girl that was telling me about it was like yeah there's a face in it and it's weird and i haven't seen it yet i didn't look um, too intensely i should i'll probably look again at some point i kind of briefly saw it and i was like oh look at that mm. but um we had this discussion though where you love a paperback, but I love mm-hmm. a hardcover. Yeah. Well, I like to take the books with me wherever I go. And so, and especially like I'll, I'll even read them like if I'm walking on a treadmill trying to get steps in or something along those lines. And it's a little hard to read a hardback book on a treadmill yes. when you're True. walking on an incline. So. You like to have your bell moment and like go through the town with a paper book in hand. Oh, I am the main character. Yes. Yes. Well, yes. aren't we all, you know? Um, no, we're no. <laughs> oh. We're not all. I mean, oh. you and I maybe are both. <laughs> Everyone else. Hmm. <laughs> but I don't know if I would say that everyone gives off main character energy, but I think you know I have, what? maybe this is a mental health issue <laughs> that we've uncovered. Well, you know, I don't think in your story, anyone else should be giving main character energy. Mm-hmm. So I'd like to think that everyone thinks they're the main character, as they okay. should. You okay, know? I'll give you that. I I, I I concede. I got you, Katie. Um. <laughs> anyways, so that was just a brief, like, introduction, just kind of saying how we met and, you know, our experiences with reading. Yeah. And so, like I said before, I made the YouTube video about New Year's resolutions, wanting to read more because I did used to like reading and I've always wanted to read, but I felt like I wouldn't make time for it. So Mm -hmm. I was like, I need to devote some time. So Katie wanted to do the book club and I had had the thought like about a month or so in, I was like, what about a podcast? So for this first episode, we thought we'd talk about, because we're three months into the year, we're in April, and we've already read three books, but, you know, we're not going to go back and, like, go chapter by chapter each book or whatever. So Mm -hmm. we thought we would just review kind of all the books we've read so far in 2023, and then kind of give a brief synopsis, our thoughts on it, maybe who we liked, who we didn't, you know. And then at the end of each book, we're going to decide 
who we would want to get a coffee with. We first read This Time Tomorrow by Emma Straub. Katie, would you like to read the summary for this? What if you could take a vacation to your past? On the eve of her 40th birthday, Alice's life isn't terrible. She likes her job, even if it isn't exactly the one she expected. She's happy with her apartment, her romantic status, and her independence and she adores her lifelong best friend. But something is missing. Her father, the single parent who raised her, is ailing and out of reach. How do they get here so fast? Does she take too much for granted along the way? When Alice wakes up the next morning, she finds herself back in 1996, reliving her 16th birthday. But it isn't just her adolescent body that shocks her, or seeing her high school crush. It's her dad, the vital, charming, 49-year-old version of her father with whom she is reunited. Now, armed with a new perspective on her, on her own life and his, some past events take on new meaning. Is there anything she would change if she could? So this book, it seemed pretty interesting with the whole aspect of, you know, waking up and your 16th birthday, being unhappy with your life and like all those trials and tribulations. Overall, I thought this book was really good. Like I was into it and like I wasn't bored necessarily at any point, Mm -hmm. but I wouldn't I would maybe say it was actually my least favorite of the three. Yeah. Ultimately. Yeah. I agree. I think there's, I think there's some really good aspects of the book and I appreciated Alice's feeling of like, life is fine. You know, like there's nothing outstanding. She has a job that's fine. It's not her dream job, you know, but she likes it well enough. Um, She's in a relationship with someone who is fine. Like, I think, I think the line that she says about him is like, oh, he's good at sex, and that counts for something. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) Didn't he, like, propose to her at a restaurant? And she was like, no. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, She kind of realizes that her life is on autopilot. And for, specifically for this relationship, like, it's just the next step. Like, they've been together for long enough that, like, marriage is the logical next step if they're going to stay together. And so he does propose on her 40th birthday and she's like, no, I don't, I don't want this and neither do you. And then I think it actually comes out that there is someone that has reached out to him from his past. And he's not that he's cheating on her, but like this other this other woman has like come up and so she essentially like releases him to be able to pursue that i guess yeah i think Um, there was was some weird aspect like that that i was like okay and then yeah basically what's the main character's name again alice 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 stern is her full name alice stern what an exciting name um yeah she's essentially going through the motions and i think we can all relate to points in our lives where we feel like we're just kind of like maybe like i don't even know content may be too nice like we're settled and we're not and it's just like not a lot is happening but there's not a lot of um I don't know, like drive. It's just you're kind of like, okay, I don't know how to get out of this, but there's nothing necessarily wrong, Mm -hmm. but I'm not necessarily happy with anything. Yeah. Like the way that I described it is that like, she's fine, but she's stuck. Like it's... Her job was kind of, I don't like, I couldn't, like her job, I was like, I remember when I was reading and her job, she was like a not a guidance counselor it was like an admissions officer admissions officer for like some like high-end private school yeah i was like i don't for some reason i'm not connecting like to this job or like i i don't know it was like weird i was like this is an odd job to like it's funny that you didn't that you didn't connect with that because i feel like how she feels about her job is kind of how you feel about accounting like that, it's, well, you know. <laughs> it's fine <laughs> you know it's what, fine Katie? but it's not yes. like it doesn't fulfill you 
it it just it kind of like was a the like like the logical step for you because you you have a master's in accounting <laughs> so it is you calling went into me out accounting. on this podcast <laughs> i'm being exposed i honestly i actually did not even think about that until this moment of like yeah i'm surprised that you didn't connect with that more um maybe you know what yeah. now that you mention it i think i did overall for that aspect and of like feeling like you're stuck in something i don't know there was something about it but yeah. now that you called me out that's definitely a reflective point <laughs> yeah that i'm gonna marinate on for a little bit <laughs> and well, be like and- <laughs> maybe i couldn't connect to alice because i didn't want to i was repressing maybe. Maybe. But like the school that she works in admissions for is the same school that she went to. And so from that's like in that you guys are different, right? Like you have she had like a connection. Yeah. And and for her, it was like she never left the like adolescent sphere that she was in. Um Mm. and I I don't like I I guess it would like the equivalent would be like, like if you were to go back and teach at your high school or something (laughs) um again i don't homeschooled so i have i don't fully understand what it is to (laughs) be in the same school with people for you know four or eight or however many years um and then to still be there and then to start seeing their kids come in i think there's this aspect of like all of her classmates like went off and started their lives and like found their in her eyes found their like purpose um but she, she never didn't did. have a purpose She's, yeah yeah which like i don't know that think... she didn't have one but she felt like she didn't have yeah, one. She, yeah she felt like she didn't have one but i also am not someone who thinks that people have like one purpose in life right True. like accounting is not my, my purpose in life it's my job <laughs> and I like it, and that's enough. It's your I identity, don't... Katie. It's You're not my identity. But an accountant. Fun fact: <laughs> my first title I thought of for this podcast was accountants that read, anyway. which I I I did run that past someone, and they're like, "Oh, that's really funny." <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I thought yeah. it was you, but Katie was like, "No," and I was just like, no, "I know there could be better ones, so it's like fine." It. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I agree. I think. When it comes to a job, too, and I've been thinking about this lately as well, I think you should at least like your job. Like, you definitely shouldn't be defined by your job. But I think when you're in a job you don't like or doing something you don't like, it can kind of cloud things. And the job can seep into other things. Mm -hmm. And you can get it confused with your purpose and all that stuff. So I totally agree. Another sad part of her life was her dad, who was dying. Mm -hmm. And that was, like, very yeah. sad and depressing. And so when she ends up waking up in her 16-year-old body, what did you think about the um location of the time traveling as far as you would go? It was essentially a shed. Yeah, Gold near, Guard House. Yeah, by her dad's place that she grew up in. Mm-hmm. And it was between the hours of 3 and 4 in the morning. And I think she, like, she had a night out, I think, for her birthday. Mm -hmm. And then she went back to the old house Mm -hmm. and was, like, thinking about her dad and everything. And then she wound up in the shed. I think maybe she didn't have a key. Yeah, so she gets drunk on her 40th birthday and decides that instead of going back to her apartment, because further away, she's going to go to her dad's house. And then realizes that she doesn't have a key, but the old guard house is there. So to kind of like wait it out until one of the neighbors who has a key wakes up, she goes into the guardhouse. Um, and that is like the portal that takes her back in time to her 16, 16th birthday. Um, so. Yes. And then essentially she's like going through, she's like freaked out, but mm-hmm. her whole thing I forget if this was the first time or the second time. She ultimately wants to, like, save her dad, in a sense. And she's seen her dad in, like, this younger form. And she's, like... Because also her thing before was she felt like she didn't have any memories with her dad. And, like, 
then when she kind of like is back in time she starts to remember like the little things between Mm -hmm. them and their relationship and then she was creating new memories and she was trying to encourage like healthy behaviors with him as far as like don't Mm -hmm. smoke and like let me see your girlfriend and like (laughs) maybe eat yeah and -hmm. like to try to avoid that and then there was also the thing with the high school crush yeah so I the way that I viewed this is that she essentially tries to fix all the things that she doesn't like. Mm -hmm. And so like the high school crush, I think his name is Tommy. um, She never did anything. She she never told Tommy that she liked him. And then which like. I. Tommy, like what actually happened on her like first 16th birthday is that Tommy hooked up with someone else from their class mm-hmm. at Alice's 16th birthday party in Alice's bed. Yes. And then Alice, even as a 40-year-old, is like, like, he's he is almost portrayed as this, like, the one that got away vibe, kind of. I think it's because, and- remember, he, like, brought his kid with his wife to the admissions thing before she time-traveled? Yeah. So it, like, feelings came rushing back. Yeah. But also, like, what's kind of a dick move. No, And I guess they're 16. But, so, like, that's one of those things where, like, that's, I think on her first trip back, she decides that she's going to tell him that she likes him. And they actually end up hooking up at her party. So now he's hooking up with her instead of the other girl. And then at the very end of the night, she, like, they're both, or he's drunk. I don't remember if Alice was drunk, but the guy Tommy is drunk. And Alice says something to the lines of, like, find me and marry me when we grow up. Something along those lines. And so when she wakes up back as a 40-year-old, she's married to him. Mm -hmm. And they have two kids that, which I thought was hilarious that she does not recognize them and cannot name them but yeah. like knows they're her <laughs> she's like oh you hi yeah it's so it, that was interesting that the fact that she could make new memories when she was there but whatever mm. had changed she didn't have the memories like she still had her old memories from before she went back in time she it's not like she would wake up in and things had changed and she also knew her history there yeah, so no. it would have to like come back to her like it would take time like she yeah. start, I think as the day went on she kind of started to remember but she wouldn't wake up she would wake up and it would be like a dream mm-hmm. and like she was living yeah. this rich lifestyle in like this nice New York apartment yeah Tom- Tommy still kind of seemed like a dick and was throwing shade up about like how much money like she likes to spend I remember yeah. that being something and then like, yeah I can't tell if that was a joke if that was like a like a a married couple's joke or if that was him being a a, dick oh you need my wallet huh yeah it's something stupid probably but also he sucks so she quickly realizes though she's not happy oh she doesn't even give it she doesn't even give it a chance not even like like a full day what's going on yeah i think she was in in that apartment for a whole of like six hours because i think also (laughs) a thing that didn't change and then consistently doesn't change is her dad still, no matter what she does, ends mm-hmm. up de- like almost dying. Yeah, he's, like, he doesn't get dead. better. He's still in the hospital. Um, the doctors can't figure out what's going on with him. So no matter like what she changes, that stays the same. And so like she keeps going back and like her focus kind of shifts after that initial trip back into like kind of what you said, like helping her dad. And so she, you know, spends more time with him during the day. She asks him to stop smoking. Um, She kind of teases him about the fact that they don't ever eat vegetables and like gets him to eat healthier. And then eventually like also encourages him to start dating and kind of says like, you know, I don't you don't need to put this on hold for me. I think is kind of the way that I remember it. Mm -hmm. um which is cool because then when she goes back one of the times she goes back she then has a stepmom who is there to kind of like help her carry the burden of caring for her dad as he like continues to 
to fade. Yes. And um, ultimately as well, I think the rest of the book, it's kind of like she becomes kind of addicted to traveling back in time mm-hmm. and like changing things and like trying to change other things and just like experiencing like her dad, like still mm-hmm. alive and healthy. Yeah. And then ultimately at the end, it's revealed like, cause she kind of settles at this one point where like her dad's still sick, but he, she does have the stepmom mm-hmm. and he, she comes clean to him about how she's been time traveling and he opens up and he's like, I know, or what it, what was it? It was like, was it in the past or it was like in the present? She does come clean. And he's like, I know you're not lying because I also time travel. Yeah. I don't remember if, I know she has the conversation with him almost every time she goes back. Cause one of the other things that she does is she actually like encourages him to write an- another book. Her dad's an author. I don't think we mentioned that her dad's an author and wrote like a, a back to the future style oh, yeah. book. And that's, why she was able to attend this like you know very elite private school and why like it that set them up but then he never wrote another book and it just like one of the things she encouraged him to do with the help of her friend sam was to write another book and so um it that like that also changed things in the future and but i cannot recall if this conversation where her dad comes clean and says yeah i also did that it has to be in the present because i don't think i think he (laughs) may have told her in the past like when she's her past stuff but like also her Mm -hmm. present self but then ultimately i it maybe but then like what's revealed is kind of like which he says maybe this part's in the present i don't know is Mm -hmm. ultimately the time traveling is what's killing him yeah, it has, would, like, an impact on your body. Yeah, and he would always, when he would time travel, would go back to the day she was born. Which is so sweet. I sweet. thought that was very sweet. And because he, I think it, they have the similarities in that they both felt like there was things that they could control and that they could fix. And so, um, like, the dad was going back, one, to like, experience the day that his daughter was born but also to try and like fix things with her mom um and ultimately like it never works her mom always leaves um and so i thought that was really sweet that like that was the moment that he went back to but yeah that because he kept going back i don't know if it like ages your body if that's the deal um but she he tells her like you know, I'm dying because of this. Stop going back. Yeah. You know, don't don't try and change things anymore. Just live, you know, live in the moment that we have. Um and let kind of like let that be enough. Um yeah. yeah. And, and so that's kind of the lesson she learns and then he ends up actually dying, which was really sad. I may have shed a tear. And then it ends with that and I did not. Oh, and then ultimately she takes that lesson and like there's like this random part where like and one of the times she went back to in time she kind of starts talking to this guy in high school who had also lost mm-hmm. his dad but she had never really talked to before but then she ended up kind of having a connection with him and then in the present I think he like messages her or something mm-hmm. and she's like I'm gonna like reach back out to him and try to pursue something yeah after her dad dies he i think he reaches out to her and is just like hey i remember what this feels like you know Mm -hmm. if you ever want to talk i'm i'm happy to talk um and i i liked i thought it the ending was choppy for sure because like she kept with the parts where she like kept going going back it was like quick it was like it was was really quick yeah Yeah, it was was like what are we doing and i think a lot of it was just her trying to like spend time with her dad um but i like that she did she does go back one more time kind of as like a farewell you know to her dad as um you know the the 49 year old version of him and i i think the way that ultimately he ends up passing is really beautiful um because he's you know on hospice in her childhood home there with the stepmom um who seems like a, a wonderful person 
and they are able to just kind of spend that time with him before he dies um and then you know like I said at the very end this guy reaches out but then you don't have anything beyond that like you don't know what is she still in the same job it kind of seems like maybe she then got like the head of admissions position yeah so maybe it's a better job maybe. but it's not really clear it was open ended it's very open ended and I, I I thought that there was going to be more conflict between Alice and her dad and that like that was her trying to like resolve that conflict and resolve her regrets about her relationship with her dad and it yeah. it's not it was not that yeah. so it was kind of like they actually had a good relationship they just I think maybe didn't share as much like there was like yeah. there was guards up yeah, I think she took her dad for granted, which I think is something that we all, all do. And so yeah. maybe that's the like the moral of the story is that we as kids or even as young adults, we take for granted that our parents are going to be there. And so we don't really appreciate the time that we spend with them. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Yeah. I think that's I definitely know. a part. I think it has a lot of lessons and a lot of things to take away. You know, for a book that we both said were was our least favorite, I feel like we've talked about it so much. <laughs> we're like, I actually, think you know what? It actually wasn't bad. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> I I've said this from the oh, I've said this the whole time. This book had so much potential, and I think it did. that That's like the thing, if you if you read into it. And you really take time to, like, pick it apart. It's there. I just yeah. don't think that it was communicated well through the first read. Like, we read this back in January. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, even though we can still talk about it and, like, we're still finding things about it, it's because we really, like, had dig through it. And we're putting our own thoughts into the book. And maybe that was the author's point. Maybe she's making us do the work like maybe that was the point maybe, maybe it we, was maybe she's a genius <laughs> maybe emma let us know but um, us up. yeah overall though i did i'll despite it being possibly my least favorite of the three i did like it and i did mm-hmm. enjoy it so i'm yeah. good with it um katie who in yes. the book this time tomorrow would you want to get a coffee with i think the dad or the best friend, Sam, because mm. Sam, because imagine like, Brandon, imagine I, I like one morning was like, hey, I am a time traveler. I, I we are still friends. We're, we're 60 years old and we're still friends. Um, Like if I came back and told you that, like you'd freak out. Mm-hmm. And so I wonder how that impacted Sam's life. Oh, yeah, because she was freaked out, but she kind of rolled with it, too. She kind of rolled with it. Right. So, like, did she think for the rest of her life that Alice really did come back and really did time travel? Or was she like, Alice, you're so kooky. You remember that time? Oh, yeah. That's true. And then I I think think the dad is really an intriguing, just an intriguing character that doesn't really get explored because he's just kind of a side character. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be interesting to get his perspective on life and us being a single dad. And also like your, like his time traveling experiences, you know? Yeah. So what about you? Who would you get coffee with? I would have to agree with the dad. I would want to get coffee with him. He seemed cool, seemed Mm -hmm. easy to talk to getting his perspective on time traveling would be interesting and kind of all of that i will say you know to take a different approach as well him being a successful writer i feel like it would be great to pitch a lot of ideas and push him back into the writing world and be like look you got to write these books like what are we doing here oh like, so you you're gonna this. you're gonna encourage him to write i thought that you were saying you're gonna pitch your ideas for your books no i'm gonna be get like, him to write my advice. ideas I'm going to get him to write my ideas and then we're both going to profit. And then it's going to be like, look, I know you're happy not writing, but we need to do this. And um, yeah, I would try to make him very successful, get some credit, get some money and, you know, but also learn about his life, you know, try to benefit both personally and professionally. Okay. 
I like it. I yes. like it. What it, what rating do you give this book? Are we doing it stars, coffee? What mm. how are we how are you? Let's let's do out of five lattes. I would give it three point two five because although I like we said, I think it had a good meaning. We had a lot to talk about. I do feel like it the ending just could have been written better and it got kind of like not sloppy at the end, but maybe sloppy. Mm-hmm. And just, like, too much jumping back and forth. And it was just, like, I don't know. I didn't go where we thought it should. So I would say 3.25 out of 5. I think that's pretty solid. I enjoyed it. But, again, it wasn't my favorite book ever. Got it. Okay. I would agree. I would probably rate it, like, if we're going to go with decimals, I would rate it a 2.8. It was, there was parts I liked about it, but I felt like. Yes, we're doing like half lattes. lattes. (laughs) A quarter latte. It's like you you order it and then, you know, almost all the way through, you're like, ugh, I don't really want any more of this. Um, That's kind of how I felt about the book. Kind of got to the end of it and I was like, ugh, yeah, I don't really want any more of this. (laughs) I think I'm good. I don't need Um, to revisit this. Yeah, I don't know that I would. This is not a book that I would pick up and read again. Um, And I don't, I don't even. I don't even know if I would actually like recommend it to a friend. Not that it was a bad book. It's not a bad book. I just, it wasn't compelling enough for me to be like, oh my gosh, you have to read this book. True. It was, it's fine. Yes. So that was our first book this time tomorrow. Now let's move on to our second book we read in February. So book number two, The Lion's Den by Catherine St. John. Embark on a trip of decadence where nothing is as it seems in this delectably suspenseful debut of friendship, romance, and betrayal on the Riviera. Belle likes to think herself immune to the dizzying effects of fabulous wealth, but when her best friend Summer invites her on a glamorous getaway to the Mediterranean aboard her billionaire boyfriend's yacht, the only sensible answer is yes— Belle hopes the trip will be a much-needed break from her stalled acting career and uniquely humiliating waitressing job. That was hard to read for some reason. Um, But once she's aboard the luxurious lion's den, it soon becomes clear this jet-setting holiday is not as advertised. Belle's dream vacation quickly devolves into a nightmare as she and the handful of other girls Summer invited are treated more like prisoners than guests by their controlling host. And in one terrifying moment, Belle comes to see Summer for who she truly is, a vicious gold digger who will stop at nothing to get what she wants. Belle realizes she's going to have to keep her wits about her and her own big secret closely hidden if she wants to make it off the yacht alive. Now I have to say, this summary is mm-hmm. a bit misleading. Which, yes. As it probably should be, because it makes it seem like she didn't expect this trip to be like this way or to be anything like scandalous. But spoiler alert, reading the book, she knew all along low key how like messed up her friend was. <laughs> <laughs> and she was undercover. Yeah. Well, here's the thing is like you're not supposed to know that. That's the reveal. That's true, like, exactly. You know, like this. It alludes to a secret, but not yeah, that secret. You don't, yeah, you don't know what the secret is. Like, I, I think this book is going to end up being like a CW show or like a Netflix limited series. Like, I was getting like Hulu limited series or something like yeah, ma- something. maybe even Peacock, something reminiscent to like, um, what's the Anna Delvey one? Or she's the one who scammed people. I forget what it's called. Oh, I don't. Remember, I don't know what the show. I know what you're talking about. I don't remember what the show is I, called. I don't. I thought of like watched it either. Outer Banks. Like I've not mm. watched Outer Banks, but from I've what seen I know the first of it, season. Okay, that's like the vibe that I was kind of picking up on. But I can to the see point that. of, yeah, a lot of intrigue, a lot of characters. There are a lot of characters. To a keep lot of characters straight. that you like even think would be important but end up not being that important Mm -hmm. like it was kind of like i was expecting more from like their other best friend whose name is escaping me wendy wendy like more to come from her but like there really wasn't anything she just kind of was a follower 
yeah of the, yeah like, awful friend so summer yeah there was many points throughout this this book that i was like why are you friends with this person because summer is awful like i don't i don't find any redeeming qualities of summer and she like from the point of them being kids right like one of the first flashbacks that you see is that i think they're in high school like 16 or 17 and they have of an attractive history teacher like a young attractive history teacher that summer french just, teacher oh it was a french my bad french teacher Something i like thought that. it was history um oh <laughs> so she like pursues him and he takes the bait because he's a creep and she ends up dragging bell with her to this guy's house where he lives with a like college roommate and the college roommate doesn't know that they're underage and summer and the teacher like disappear into the teacher's room at one point um and then this the college friend starts like feeling up bell and like tries to have sex with her and then bell like in he won't like he's not taking no for an answer and finally like yells out that she's only 16 and he like flips and then summer and the, the teacher show up obviously having just had sex and you know it's this whole thing and then summer ends up getting the teacher fired which like granted he should be fired like he should be in jail um but she was like she would put bell in bad situations right she just really summer always kind of wanted i think because of her mom always jumping to guys and like kind of like men who had money and like all this stuff summer always wanted this luxurious life Mm -hmm. and to the point though where like she went crazy and like murderous Mm -hmm. um so it it took a left and i think with bell there is something with her life where like she didn't feel like she was exciting or anything and summer brought like excitement and it was just kind of like summer likes me summer accepts me and she leads like this exciting life and like i want her approval and like all this different stuff Mm -hmm. and like you know i think we've all we've all had like a toxic friendship Mm -hmm. before and maybe not to this level but um a toxic friendship in general but then like you get to a point where either you naturally like it ends or you realize it's toxic and you end it. Bell kind think... of Bell knew it was toxic. She talks well, no. about it like she brings it up so many times of like how Summer is a bad friend. Yeah. And but... continues to let her like walk all over her. Yeah, you know, it it was it got to a point where it was like when Bell was staying like at her apartment, like in the more present and like not paying rent and kind of like taking over it was like girl like bell like you need to put your foot down i think she kind of does at one point but um it just you know when we're in this book and we're learning about their past and like bells on this yacht Mm -hmm. we're like wondering why did you go on this yacht like are you dumb like what's wrong (laughs) with you yeah there are so many points where i was like why did you agree to this vacation yeah. like i don't it, care how glamorous it is like this is crazy it was crazy because it was like they would like lock the doors at night and mm-hmm. then it was like they would take their phones and their passports yeah. it the was passport just thing blew my mind when they started just handing over their passports i was like uh absolutely not that is right? the end for me like no you can't have my passport like that's that's international travel 101 you don't give like, anybody r- your passport right and that was like right at the beginning too they were like <laughs> we need your passport and she's like as oh. soon as they went through customs they took their passports i would have been like i gotta go yeah um but too like i mean it made me want to go to like france and like the riviera like that part seemed <laughs> glamorous yeah but they didn't have like wi-fi on the boat they could only use this one computer and there was cameras mm-hmm. everywhere and throughout the book, Belle is, like, emailing her sister 
and like telling her about the trip and the sister yeah. would be like oh sounds sketchy but it may just be a thing anyways hope you enjoy and i'm like who this who is yeah. this sister she sucks like she is not trying to save like clearly like bell is going yeah. through it and this is all sketchy and her sister's not even trying to like give advice or help so mm-hmm. i'm like who is this sister and then throughout yeah. the book they kind of hint at this one guy what was his name again eric eric and like they would be like don't bring that up in front of summer or summer would say don't bring it up in front of uh, like her boyfriend and like Mm -hmm. it was like this point of contention yeah and like yeah constantly and like you find out through one of the flashbacks that uh summer had met eric eric is like a an artist in i think it was in new york um and and Summer was cheating on her current boyfriend with Eric. And then Summer and Belle were supposed to go to this art show. Summer was late because her, I think her like, boyfriend showed up or something. Something along those lines. Or he wanted to FaceTime. I don't remember. Yeah. So Belle goes and Belle meets this man. And they have this like instant connection. They are like up on the roof talking and then Summer shows up. They go downstairs and they find out that this man is Eric, who Summer has like gotten her claws into. So Belle like immediately backs off, but they still have this connection and they kind of like continue to have a connection. Like Summer doesn't pursue anything with Eric, um, but they have these like moments where um like at one point that they ran into each other in like a flower shop and it ends up raining and i think bell like rips her pants or something like some wardrobe yeah. malfunction happens and so they end up back at eric's apartment um so she can like dry off and i think like maybe get a change of clothes or something and they have like a moment there and i think they kiss but Summer me- or uh, Belle is immediately like, no, like we can't do this. I can't do this to Summer. She's my friend. Um, and then uh, Summer makes this offhanded comment um, in one one time in the book where um, Belle is high. I think she had gotten taken like mushrooms or something with one of her friends, one of her other friends, and Summer wants to use Belle's phone. And Bell goes to tell her the passcode, and Summer goes, "Oh, I know it. You use the same thing for everything." And that was a moment where I was like, "Why does Summer know your passcode? Mm-hmm. This is Summer- not someone that you want to have your passcode." Summer is a snake because essentially, I think she kind of had an idea that there was a connection between Eric and Bell mm-hmm. because yeah. of um, just like their connection and that made summer insecure oh and she, very yeah very she jealous. wanted to be the one that was always desired and bell was like the sidekick mm-hmm. kind of yeah yeah so it is revealed that summer did know about eric and bell because she went through bell's phone yes because and she has she, the passcode and she found the polaroid because i guess didn't eric take a polaroid of bell and put it in his drawer yes and then Ooh, she, he's a summer photographer. found it. Like, he is a photographer. He's a photographer. So it's not like it's out of the ordinary that he would have been taking pictures. But again, Summer being insecure and incredibly jealous, like flips out and decides to get quote unquote revenge on them. Even mm. though, again, mind you, the only thing that has happened so far is the fact that they shared a kiss, which if I remember correctly, Eric had even said at that point they he and summer were not together yeah they were like Um, on and off it was like yeah and it sounds like eric had told summer multiple times that like he didn't want to be with her but summer had kind of like maybe because she had never really been um like turned down that she like flipped and just got super possessive of him so, yeah, because her thing, she would, like, relay back their relationship differently to her friends. And be like, he's obsessed mm-hmm. with me, of course. And da-da-da-da-da. Yeah. But we, right. then we would learn, like, he was, like, trying to end things. <laughs> like, he yeah. Was, like... yeah. And she wouldn't do it. And she's being super needy. And then she, like, lures him out to, uh, like, a cliff in California. 
under the guise of being Belle and Belle wanting to meet up with him. And she pushes him off a cliff. Yes, because another plot twist that we learn. So here's the thing. Eric in the flashbacks, we meet his brother. His brother and Belle kind of have a thing, but it quickly passes. Yeah. And then, but it's ultimately revealed the brothers have contention because of their father Mm -hmm. being like this businessman that's like evil and like they Mm -hmm. don't have a good relationship. We find out that the old guy that invited them to the yacht and like Summer's new boyfriend is in fact Eric's father. And so Eric was trying to get him, get Summer not to get with him and tell him he's a bad guy. Summer was worried that... Eric was going to tell his dad that Eric and Summer used to have a thing and she wanted to live this lavish life and like do all this. So she pushes him off the hill to stop him from exposing them. I also think it was a little bit of jealousy of like, if I can't have you, no one can type of vibe. Oh, yeah. Um, Because it was layered. It was layered. You're right. And I think, but just like John's personality, I don't, he's, a sleaze like i don't think he would have cared if summer had had a fling with his son like as gross as that is like i don't think he would have cared no he wouldn't have and there's this whole other like c plot this book if we're all over the place it's because this book was low-key kind of all over the place but when you read it you're like in it and it's actually a really good book um it keeps you on the tips of your toes but ultimately the john guy he's like a shady businessman and he's doing a lot of like bad shady deals and Eric is working to expose him Mm -hmm. and gathering all this evidence and like talking to people from like John's past and business and like getting testimonials from them and all this evidence. It's also revealed that John was insanely abusive to Eric's mom because Eric Mm -hmm. and his brother have different moms, just the same dad. So he was abusive to the mom and it ultimately led to the mom. Um, I did she unalive herself. I think she did, yeah. So that happened. So he has all this resentment. And it's revealed more and more why he hates him. And so he was building a case against him. He comes back home to his apartment, though, and it's been ransacked. All the evidence is taken. And then ultimately, when Summer had pushed him off the hill, he's on the run because John and his people are looking for him. Mm -hmm. They don't know for sure if he is dead or alive. But everyone else in his life thinks he's dead. And then he randomly shows up at Bell's door, very injured, right? Because he just got pushed off mm-hmm. of a cliff and had to like walk and find his way back to to where she is in California. Um, and so she, he convinces her to drive him to Mexico, um, where he has a contact and he's able to have like a safe house there. And then he convinces her to go undercover on this yacht trip and Mm -hmm. he is the quote-unquote sister that she's been emailing this whole time with updates but it's because she has this like bracelet Mm -hmm. i think it's supposed to be like a fitbit type of vibe something like that it like records video and audio was it the watch that summer was kind of like where'd you get that watch yeah yeah, it's the one where, where she, yeah, oh, that's right, it was a watch. Um, yeah, the one that Summer, at when they get on there, she's like, oh, that's super cute, can I can I try it on? And Belle's like, no, I'm not supposed to let anyone else wear it. It's, like, synced to, like, my, my like, bodily rhythms or something yeah. like that. Like, it's supposed Some to. Some weird excuse. It's kind of, do you know, it's like that, isn't there something that's called, like, whoop or something like that that's supposed to, like tell you how you slept and like how your body has recovered from workouts and like it sounded like something like that at first and I was like why are you why what like that's not yeah this is weird but it ends up being this this piece of tech that Eric gives her that is recording video and audio all -hmm. the time and then when it she gets into wi-fi uploads it Mm -hmm. so he has it as evidence um and that ends up like really coming in handy and then the other thing is that at the beginning of the book when the first one of the first emails that she gets from her sister is this meme that 
her sister's like, yeah, it might take a second to download, but when I saw it, I thought of you. And it ends up being like a like a bug or a virus that like allows them to hack into the server that's on mm-hmm. the yacht. Like, so I they can get the... like everything. Yeah, he has like all of the plans of of John and like all of the shady stuff that he's doing. And essentially, because they have that, they're able to like blackmail John into giving up control of his company uh to eric and doesn't eric then like sell the company he does i believe he sells it to this nice other rich family that because during um the yacht trip bell and like summer takes all the girls to like these different excursions that are pretty weird and controlling for the most part but one of them was um going on this other yacht with these like other rich people and like this rich party and there was like this rich family that was actually like really cool and down to earth and very like bell kind of connected with them and they were like they were inviting john and them to kind of like keep a good business relationship but they knew how shady john was Mm -hmm. so i think he ultimately ended up selling it to them for like what was it like 30 million dollars or something something crazy crazy. yeah some crazy amount and like bell had helped him and like there's one point because summer had like kicked didn't let bell back on the yacht because bell was like five minutes late to returning after shopping Mm -hmm. and so bell's bell got her phone but it was dead she was running around europe trying to get to this place it ended up one of the security guards of john was working for eric and Mm -hmm. was like go to this place yeah the place ended up being like your your sister's gonna meet you at this place yeah yeah and it was it ended up being Eric's mo- grandma's mm-hmm. place, and so um, John's mother, and so they end up meeting there. And when she gets there, it's like Summer and um, John are there, but then Eric shows up. Yeah, and then that's when they like reveal everything. They get him to sign over the company. Mm. They get like all this money, and then it ends with them on like this private jet having a moment over champagne and like it, it's a very happy ending mm-hmm. yeah i really liked this book i thought it was good and like once you get into it you like don't want to stop reading it mm-hmm. like i think you had finished this book before me and you're like oh my god it gets so good and yeah. I'm like okay i gotta get into it and it was just it was really good it keeps you on the tips of your toes it's very exciting you kind of don't know what's gonna happen next Lots mm-hmm. of twists and turns, as you yes. may have gathered from us. So many. Um, but ultimately, Katie, out of one to five lattes, how many lattes? I give this four. It was four lattes. Four. This was a book that I very much enjoyed. Uh, it's a book, book that I would recommend to people um, and actually have recommended it to a couple of my friends because I think they'd really like it. Um, so, yeah, I would say four out of five lattes. All right. What about you, Brandon? I would give it 3.75 because it was really good. I did enjoy it more than this time tomorrow. But I did feel at some point, like, it was kind of hard to really emotionally connect with any of the characters. Mm-hmm. And just kind of like, I did feel like, although it was good and all over the place, it was kind of all over the place at yeah. some point. So I was like, okay, this is wild. Ultimately, though, I liked it a lot. I liked that it had a happy ending. Mm -hmm. And I would definitely recommend this book. And I think 3.75 is pretty solid. So I liked it. Um, Who would you get a coffee with? Uh, John's security guard. I was trying to remember what his name was. I don't remember what the guy's name was, but the one that it was I feel like they may have Eric. not even given him a name. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe I think they, they did it. at some point. I just don't remember what it is. But I feel like that man, like, because to, to your point, I also did not emotionally connect with any of the characters. Like, mm-hmm. it's so outside my personality and, like, my life that I was like, this is nuts. Other than the fact of, like, I've had toxic friendships that you know thankfully have ended um and i didn't stay in them very long um but i didn't none of the characters or people that i was like oh i really like this character they all were just like you serve a purpose in this story but i think excuse me the 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 bodyguard would be fascinating to talk to 
because he's in all of those meetings that John has. He's seen and a lot. He's seen a lot. And then he's like also helping Eric. So like that, like how he how he balanced that whole thing out. Yeah, he'd mm-hmm. be the security guard. All right. I would say it's hard because a lot of these characters were very annoying. Yeah. Um, if I had to pick, I forget her name, but it would be the mom of that rich family that they sold the company to. Oh, yeah. Because I she think like she was, fun. was she Australian? I feel Maybe. like she may have been. She was something. And she just seemed fun and like a good time and her family seemed like a good time and they're rich. I'm like, I just feel mm-hmm. like it would be a good time. We could get some good stories about life. About because yeah. she was pretty insightful too. Mm-hmm. Like she's really yeah. interesting. And mm-hmm. like she would have wise words. And then like, you know, coffee would be on her. She's didn't, rich. <laughs> didn't she also like take an edible at one point with her son? Yes, they like smoked and then it led to like yeah. a whole like thing where they were like singing karaoke and stuff like that on yeah. the piano. It was fun. Oh, yeah. It was a good time. Super fun. Yeah. She would she be super like fun. a good time. Agreed. But yes, overall, love this book. I would actually rank this book second of the three. Yeah, I agree. And so, yeah. which leads us to our third and final book we've read so far. It's called The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by V.E. Schwab. Never pray to the gods that answer after dark. France, 1714. In a moment of desperation, a young woman named Adeline meets a dangerous stranger and makes a terrible mistake. As she realizes the limitations of her bargain, being able to live forever without being able to be remembered by anyone she sees, Addie chooses to flee her small village as everything she once held dear is torn away. But there are still dreams to be had and a life to live. And she is determined to find excitement and satisfaction in the wide beckoning world, even if she is doomed to be alone forever. Or not quite alone, as every year on her birthday, the alluring Luke comes to visit, checking to see if she is ready to give up her soul. Their darkly thrilling game stretches through the ages, seeing Addie witness history and fight to regain herself as she crosses oceans and tries on various lives. It will be 300 years before she stumbles into a a hidden bookstore and discovers someone who can remember her name. And suddenly, everything changes again. This was definitely my favorite book out of the three. Mm -hmm. It felt like just very, like the most well-rounded. It was a journey. It was a movie. It was cinema. It was everything. I liked it a lot. And yeah. it made me depressed in the beginning. I remember when I was first reading it, I was like, I don't know. This book is like so sad because you see Addie in her life in France and like she's so unhappy. She wants to like see the world. She doesn't want to be confined to these societal standards where the woman stays at home and gets married and has kids and like withers away and doesn't like get to experience the world. So she's so unhappy and then there she's about to get married to this guy she does not love. She does not want to get married. She ends up running away into the woods And that's where she is confronted by the God after dark because she didn't realize it was something like, it was like 650. And then, but then when she got to the woods, she didn't realize it was turning dark Uh and it was like dark behind her. So like an evil God, Luke came Mm -hmm. to her and he was like the embodiment of like her fantasy, like man that she's like evoked. Mm -hmm. And then She ultimately makes, like, what she wants is to, like, not be tied to anyone Mm -hmm. and, like, be able to, like, live, like, does she say live forever or something to that effect? So what she says is that, um, so she runs into the woods and, like, the whole, you know, don't, don't call out to the gods who answer after dark is something that her, like, village um like spiritual woman i don't i don't know kind of how to describe estelle but estelle is this like very old woman who lives in her village who still keeps to like the old gods and it's like you know the the river god 
god and the forest god and you know there's just kind of it's almost like it's nature um is almost she's like kind she's of saying. like the village witch yeah like she she says when she dies that she just wants to be buried under a tree um and she is kind of a kindred spirit to adele a, or to Adele, <laughs> Adeline. To Adele. Adele. To, Adele to, came to in Addie. randomly and started yes. singing someone like you. Yes. <laughs> um, oh my gosh. Anyways, Adeline. Um, and so she's the one that warns Adeline to never call on the gods that answer after dark. But, you know, she didn't realize it was dark. And then Luke shows up. And she, what she says is that she doesn't want to belong to anyone but herself. She wants to be free, free to live and to find her own way to love or to be alone. But at least it is her choice. And she kind of keeps saying this of like, she doesn't want to be tethered to anyone. And, you know, she keeps saying what she doesn't want rather than what she does. And Luke finally is like, you want time. Like you want freedom with no rules. You want to be untethered. You want to live as you please. And, you know, she she agrees and you know at first he's like well that's nice but i'm not helping you and then she's like well you can have my soul when i'm done with it you can have my soul and then he makes the bargain Mm -hmm. and you know it's he twists you know what she wants is is freedom to be able to go and live her life and not have to conform to society's standards but because he's evil (laughs) Mm -hmm. he you know he twists it and instead her saying she doesn't want to be tethered to anyone means that no one remembers her within you know they see her face and if they turn around all memory of her is erased and she can't she finds out like she can't speak her own name she can't write it down she can leave no mark on anything um if she spills something it disappears if she rips something up you know suddenly it's it's whole again um she can't influence or make it or she can't not influence but she can't impact she can't change anything around her yeah it's pretty wild because also when she like after she makes the deal she tries to go back home and like her parents are like who is this stranger get out of our house and yeah. they, like, kick her out, and it's, like, heart-wrenching. She tries to go to Estelle's, and she doesn't remember. And it's just, like, that first, because the book kind of cuts back and forth between her past in France when it first happens, and then, like, mm-hmm. 300 years later in New York City when she's, like, figured it out and figured how to, like, navigate her life throughout, like, with this curse. So... The first part where it's just, like, showing her adapting to it that first year and her struggles and her trials Mm -hmm. and tribulations, it's so sad and, like, heartbreaking and, like, seeing how, like, depressing it can be and, like, her just, like, not being remembered, not being able to find a home. She can feel things, but it, like, it won't kill her. Like, she feels hunger, but she doesn't have to eat because she's gonna live she can feel like she'll have to like sleep outside in like the snow and she Mm -hmm. can feel the coldness and all of that but it's not affecting her in the way of like she's not gonna die but she still feels the pain yeah if she's wounded she will feel the wound but then the wound will heal and she it won't affect her yes yeah so basically it's all of that and then in her present life with new in new york she goes to this bookstore tries to steal a book the guy who owns the bookstore henry catches her and then um he like ends up letting her keep it but then since she's like oh he won't remember me Mm -hmm. so like i can go back and return the book or exchange it she goes back the next day and he remembers her and Mm -hmm. she's like wait what and like her big thing too is just like she would form like these intimate connections with people throughout her life, but they would just forget her like the next day. Or I think it's like a one night stand that like they don't remember they got too drunk for. So Mm -hmm. it was like this also heartbreaking thing of her like loving people and them not even knowing who she is. So like Mm -hmm. the fact that someone just remembered her in general, she was like, what the fuck? This is a curse. Like this is a trick. Like this is not good. Mm -hmm. And yep. 
Yeah. They ultimately, like, they start to build a connection. And then she's wondering, like, why are you able to remember me? Like, why is no one else Mm -hmm. able to remember me but you are? And that's when Henry reveals he also made a deal with the devil. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So that's when we really learned that, like, the darkness, who is named Luke in the book because that's the name that Addie gives him. He he doesn't have a shape. He doesn't have sustenance. He appears in whatever, like in whatever way the the person who summoned him wants him to appear. So in the case of Addie, it's this man that she had like drawn and fantasized about, who she had named Luke in her mind, and then um, we find out that he. This is kind of what he does. He is in the business of souls and so he will find people who are hurting or who are kind of at their wits end and will seemingly offer them a way out in exchange for their soul and Mm -hmm. you find out that it's people like i think what isn't one of the people like beethoven um yeah and like frank sinatra like there would be these random like famous people that he's like oh yes i took their soul too and yeah. like to, so they could do this and I'm like this is wild yeah. but yeah. ultimately with Henry the thing like with these books and like something I noticed I forget if the lion's den did this but I know this time tomorrow did at least is it start they have like parts in this part it would be basically from Henry's perspective like of the present and his past as to how he um got like the curse and like met mm-hmm. Luke Ultimately, it was revealed Henry was, like, very depressed. He never felt like he was enough for people whenever it came to, like, his family, his education, his friendships, his relationships. He proposed to this girl he thought he was in love with. She rejected him and was just like, you're just not the one. You're not enough. And all this. So it comes to a point where, like, this pivotal point where one night it just all comes crashing down. I think it was the night when she had rejected his proposal, he gets sad, he gets drunk. He's, like, not wanting to, like, live anymore. Mm -hmm. And, like, it's, like, raining. And then that's when this figure comes, Luke. Yeah. And so, but he notices Luke's, it's raining, but Luke's not, like, getting wet. And he's like, Mm -hmm. who's this guy? And so, ultimately, Luke curses him to make a curse or, like, a deal where he's enough for everyone Mm -hmm. like he will be loved he will be enough no one will be able to say like that henry isn't enough so when it cuts back to like his present day it's like weird there's like a fog in people's eyes when they see him and like anytime they see henry it's like they remind him of like what they want and what's enough for them Mm -hmm. yeah they see in him what they like most want so whether it's like a friend or it's you know a, a like a romantic per like connection type of deal like, like he is suddenly like enough for them but it's never real it's because yeah. of the bargain they don't that he see made. any bad in him like they're yeah. not being real with him yeah 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 and it starts to make him even more like kind of depressed in a way he's like what is this yeah because none of his connections are real. Yeah. Right. Like if these people aren't choosing him, they mm-hmm. they're almost like forced to to love him. And that's like that's not what he wanted. But again, you have to be so careful with your words. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, Luke twists the words so much. Um, But it's interesting that it ends up being like his curse is why he can remember Addie, because what Addie desires most is for someone to remember her. Um, but she is like immune to his to his curse. Like she genuinely it... feels a connection with him. Yes, which that part was interesting too, because it was essentially like you needed his curse was I want to be enough for everyone, and what's enough mm-hmm. to her is someone remembering her. But mm-hmm. she didn't have, like, the fog in her eyes or anything, which maybe it's because of her curse that kind of counteracted that part of the curse. Yeah, it could be. Like, but it was something. So they were able to, like, bond. Like, that's why he was able to remember her. 
they end up falling in love. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it kind of like when it's cutting back and forth between Addie's past and present, um, Luke visits her on the anniversary of the curse almost every year. Some years not. He always Mm -hmm. messes with her and she like defies him and she like hates him. But then she kind of grows to expect or like yearn for his arrival because essentially Mm -hmm. Luke is the only one that like remembers her and the only like true Mm -hmm. connection she has and they also end up starting a love affair that was a plot twist I did not see coming well because again like he doesn't have he's not human he's smoke He's a like, shadow. He's, he, yeah. And so she even at one point is like, so they're, they're like, they were having their dalliances and like, he, he seems in that, like, it seems like he genuinely cares about her. Like, it's kind of yeah. this, like, they start off as, you know, they've done this bargain and she, they kind of piss, piss each other off because he, wants her soul and she's like no i'm not done with it you can't have it no you know no matter how hard this is like i i'm gonna fight this i'm gonna i'm going to to live this out i'm not giving you my soul i'm not giving up and then on the flip side for her like he's this he represents defeat and so she's not gonna give in to him and I think just because of that, and because it's like, you know, hundreds of years at this point that Addie has resisted giving him her soul, eventually, you're right, like, they are, they they kind of become, they have this, like, camaraderie, and it's like, she hates him, but she also looks forward to seeing him because he knows her past, and she can have these conversations with him about what's happening and what has happened in the past and you know about life that she can't have with other people um because they don't remember her and so it it was surprising because he's not human but it wasn't surprising that they would find connection with one another his part in it surprised me i think more because i'm like what are you doing dude like you're like this evil like devil god or whatever like getting feelings for addy addy i could get she's like it's been 300 years and yeah. i need a connection so i got it yeah. it was just it was just strange in general i, I will like say it humanizes him in a weird way it did and yeah. it was just odd but ultimately, you know, one thing that as she's as she's falling in actual love with like Henry and they're forming mm-hmm. like a real tangible connection, she realizes, I think they go to a museum and like before she couldn't write anything, she couldn't tell her story, but she could tell her story to him. Like mm-hmm. she could say everything to him. She could say her name to him. She and she also realized she could kind of like write, like if he would take the pen and put she put her hand over him, she could like write and like that brought her such joy. And she was like, mm-hmm. Oh my god. And then ultimately she ends up telling her story to him and he writes it down. So it's just like it's solid like evidence of her mark. Because also before, kind of like a side plot or like a side thing that would happen is she lived 300 years she kind of would make her mark in small ways because she Mm -hmm. would like hook up with people or like make connections with people that like were kind of artists Mm -hmm. and then they ultimately like would like not remember her but like start something when like start a painting of her when she was there but then when she would leave they would kind of like forget her but they would still have the painting yeah, so, she was like this like muse almost. Yes. And so she shows up in all of these like different um period periods of art mm-hmm. where like it wouldn't make sense for the same woman to show up throughout like, you know, spanning hundreds of years of art and like how it changes and shifts, but yet this similar silhouette keeps showing up and it's mm-hmm. Addie. Like she, you know, she has the, she's figured out how to form these connections with people so that even though they won't remember her, 
she's still kind of there. So like to your point of whether they start the oil painting and then, you know, they think they've had this one night stand, but you know, they're going to, they're going to paint her. Cause she's, be- she's beautiful. Like that's mentioned a lot of how pretty she is. Um, but if they like try and take a picture of her, it either like won't develop or it'll be like foggy. Like you can't really see her, her features. face is like, blurry. Yeah. It's very, it's crazy, but she figured out a way around it. She figured out how to leave her mark. And she, like, same thing with musicians. Like, she would, at one point, she has this, like, months-long affair with this musician where she, like, writes this song and she just keeps feeding it to him. And then he remembers the song but doesn't remember her. Mm-hmm. Like, it's it's very interesting. It is. And then, ultimately... They're falling in love, but Henry's still very apprehensive, and he Mm -hmm. reveals to her part of his curse was he's enough for everyone, but he has to give Luke his soul after a year. Yeah. And by the time he reveals this, there's like a month left. And she's like, why would you do that? Yeah. (laughs) But then she's also like, I can't really judge because I made my curse and I didn't know and kind of you're at this low point you're willing to do anything and like he's like freaking out because he's like I didn't want any time and a year seems so long but now it's escaping me and it's going by so fast and now I want all the time yeah and so ultimately Addie goes to Luke and she's trying to help um uh Henry out and like get the curse to be changed so he doesn't have to give his soul after like a year Mm -hmm. and luke is jealous he doesn't want to go back on it he wants addy to himself and he's just he's not he's like i'm not in the business of like changing curses like that or whatever Mm -hmm. yeah ultimately what addy says that resonates with luke is give him back let him keep his soul and i will be yours forever I will be yours for as long as you want me by your side. As long as you want me by your side. Yes, that's an important detail. So when it comes to the time to, for like, it's the day where Henry should be, his soul should be taken. Addie's like, no, this is what I did. And Addie ends up getting swept into the darkness. Yeah, like Luke comes in and takes her. She doesn't tell Henry until like, Right before Luke comes like to the get last her. second. She's yeah. like, by the way. Yeah, by the way, I did this for you. Don't forget me. Because she's and... also like, I've lived all this life. I want yeah. him to be able to live this life. And like, this has been such a great experience, but I don't want him to like die. Yeah. Yeah. It's like she she's helped him like overcome his like depression. And now it's like she wants him to be able to live life and not to because they henry's described a couple of times as like someone who feels too much and so i think where and i think that's where a lot of his like anxiety and depression comes from because he just feels everything around him so deeply and there's something with his relationship with Addie that kind of helps him see that you know he doesn't have to be everything to everyone and he can have these like genuine connections with people um and and it's okay like he kind of gets better um which i don't know that's really how mental health works but in the book is really nice and so she wants to be able to give him this chance to live his life and um so she's willing to give luke what he wants in order for luke to release henry and what's cool is that she kind of says like hey don't forget me and so he takes all of the the stories that she has dictated to him and writes the book but instead of putting his name on it which would have would make sense i don't remember if he doesn't put any name or if he just puts addy i think he just Um, puts addy as the author yeah, because it's it's the the book that he writes in the book is also the Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, mm-hmm. um, little like Inception there, um, but he doesn't have his name on it. They figure out like it's well known who wrote it, but the fact that his name isn't on it is like a like a cool thing that 
people talk about like Ooh, mm-hmm. this author is so cool right. he, didn't put his, he didn't put his name on it he didn't mm-hmm. you know he wanted to stand on its own type of deal um so it's like because of addy and addy's influence on him he does end up kind of finding his purpose and is able to live like this this really beautiful life or so you hope it's not displayed in the book but that's kind of what's hinted at yes so and then it ends the book Addie is in London she's now with um Luke and she's she's in a bookstore she sees the whole display of the book the invisible life of Addie LaRue and she's like happy and she's like this is crazy and then Luke comes to her they have a moment and then we kind of get her inside thoughts where she's like the thing about Luke and I that's different is he doesn't like he's not he doesn't look too much into the details of things that are said. He's not very like, like he doesn't think of the long term because mm-hmm. the deal was I'll stick by you as long as you want me to not forever. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to make sure he doesn't want me to. So which, this curse will end. Yeah. Which you don't know at what point it's kind of her, like her checkmate move. Yes. Cause uh, there was always a power struggle between yes. them. Yes. Very much so. And that also is kind of crazy that for someone who twists words so much that he would not have caught on that. like, Or he just thought, well, I'm always going to want you by my side. Because he, yes. like, when they had their, like, dalliance, you know, in the past, they, and ultimately, like, there ends up being a falling out. And Addy, like, accuses him of not actually loving her and just doing that to kind of like lull her into giving up her soul Mm -hmm. and he's like you know he essentially says like yeah that's it and then later comes back and is like no i lied i was just hurt and i do actually love you and want you so i don't know if luke just thought that he would always want her and so he was like "Oh, oh it's not a big deal or if she kind of really did outsmart him at his own game yeah, because he was a little off his game because he let his emotions or something get in the way. Which is a very human thing to do mm-hmm. for a deity. So For a demon. A demon. Um, but yeah, and so the book ends like that, and it's a pretty hopeful ending, Um, mm-hmm. but apparently the author has no plans on writing a sequel, so we're going to have to deal with it. Um, Overall, though, great book, loved mm-hmm. it, wonderful journey. Um, Katie, who are you getting a coffee with? Um, honestly, probably Luke. (laughs) (laughs) I think that he would be, it would be so interesting to know, like, who made deals with him and what the deal was. Like, I don't, I don't want to make a deal. Like, I don't need that. Um, but I would love to know, like, who, who he made deals. Like, what, what was the most, like was the best deal he ever made or like the most heinous like it would just be really cool to see does he target certain people like yeah do you think he could coerce you into a deal like you think you could outsmart him but you're like oh no (laughs) no i don't think i could i don't i'm not that good with words um i would just not want to make a deal like i don't know that there's anything that i desire at this point in my life, I don't know that there's anything that I desire so much that I'm willing to give my soul for it. Mm-hmm. Um, pretty content with where I'm at in life. So, but yeah. I think if I had been in Addie's situation in you know France in the 1700s, like for sure, I think I would have made the deal because that like that's terrifying. Yeah. So oh, I definitely understand at some level what she was feeling and i think if i was in that similar situation that i would have also made that deal true that i think so too yeah who you getting coffee with i'm getting coffee with estelle i liked her i wish she was even a bigger part of the book she was just Mm -hmm. like the village witch that talks shit about everyone and like (laughs) was wise and would talk about like the gods and the spirits Mm -hmm. and she was kind of like quirky and i'm like she'd be a good time she would be have a coffee with and just talk shit about people. Although it would probably be tea. I feel like she would give you some like, like 
That's true. Strong, potentially hallucinogenic tea. Honestly, I'm open to it with Estelle. I'll do it. And I do like tea, so I'm yeah. okay with it. What is what's the drug that you do um ayahuasca? Ayahuasca. I it feel would like be. I feel like Estelle does ayahuasca. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So it might end up being that, which would make it an even a more exciting experience. It's true. Um that is true. Out of one to five lattes, I'd probably give this book a 4.1 lattes. Yeah. Because yeah. it was a solid book. It was good. There were some parts that were a little boring that I had to push through. Like, I thought mm-hmm. sometimes her flashbacks to, like, the 1700s were a little slow. Mm-hmm. I actually thought, though I like Henry, his point of view was a little slow. And I was just yeah. kind of, like, not as interested as I was in Addie's. Because also with Henry's, it's like... Oh my god, he made people love you. Okay. And then there's like, we got it. But overall, yeah. though, I thought it was solid. I thought it was the most well-rounded of the three we've read so far. Mm-hmm. And I would definitely recommend this book. And I would love for it to be a movie. Yeah, I agree. I would rate this probably like a yeah, like a 4.1 or 4.2, somewhere in there. Because yeah. I agree. I think it's a, that was a, a well-rounded book overall. Um, couple of slow moving parts, uh, maybe a little bit too focused on like the beginning of Addie's journey. I think maybe you could have done, I, I think it would have been interesting to see more of how she figured out certain things. Mm-hmm. Um, and Henry, I did not connect with Henry as a character. Um, I don't know that I can say that I have like felt what henry feels like i'm not someone who feels things too deeply so i i think that he's a character that probably a number of people would relate to um and would kind of enjoy his pov but it yeah for me it wasn't he it i I don't think that i could be with someone like henry (laughs) like i think henry is is too too emotional (laughs) You're too emotionally needy. I can't with this. Yeah. So, um, but I mean, I liked him as a character, but he's not someone that I necessarily connected with. Um, But I really liked the book. I think it would be a great movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was the final book we've read so far. Yeah. And then for April, the book we are going to read is called, it's a book that I think has gone viral before. And, like, maybe on TikTok, I don't know, but it's very popular. It's called Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow, a novel. Gabrielle Zevin. Or Zevin? I don't know. Yeah, sounds right. But that's the book we're going to read next. And so, yeah, that's what we're going to talk about this month on our weekly episodes. But this episode, you know, it's the first episode just discussing the books we've Mm -hmm. read so far. The odd similarities. The time travel aspect that seems to stay consistent with us. Yeah. I think this might even have some time stuff as well. Yeah, I think it. there's some like back like back and forth between different points in time pretty much in all of the books. Like not all of them are as like you don't go as far back as like Alice did in Mm -hmm. This Time Tomorrow or like, you know, through as much time as Addie does in, in, you know, The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue. Um, but yeah, definitely some similar, uh, similarities between the three books, but I, I said, I like really liked pretty much all, everything we've read so far and I'm excited for the next one. So same. I thought they were all solid reads so far, but with that being said, that's it for the first episode of the literary latte podcast. Going forward, Um, they probably won't be this long. (laughs) Probably not. This one's probably going to be a little bit longer because we were trying to cover three books. We got into it a little more than we expected with some of them. But, um, you know, that's okay. You know, it's a long listen. If you're working, it's something to listen to. If you if this makes you want to read the books, even though we spoiled some stuff. um, Or if you read the books, you would enjoy it. But, um, yeah, yeah, with that being said, thank you all so much for listening. Make sure to subscribe rate and review we're available i think so far on spotify and apple Podcasts. probably will be available more on any on other um podcast platforms but for right now the two main hitters 
So, with that being said, thank y'all so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you.